Hello and welcome to the Core Advantage Podcast. My name is Darren McInnes. And I'm Jacob Tober. Uh, on the podcast, we talk about all things sports science, strength and conditioning and athletic development. You'll find links, show notes and references in the podcast details and also on our website. All right. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Random Thought Show. I'm joined today by Dr. Dom Kondo. How are you going, Dom? Good. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. And we're also joined by Josh Ke- Kylie. Sorry, Josh. Uh, one of our coaches here who's also a vegan and Dom is an accredited sports dietitian. Correct. And we're going to talk about the game changes. It is on everyone's minds right now. Everyone's going plant-based. Everyone's talking about thinking about going vegan, which is has its pros and cons, which we're going to discuss today. Um, Dom, you've seen the movie. Are I have. You, are you now a vegan? No, I'm not a vegan. Um, no, it didn't persuade me that much. <laughs> so there's been a lot of, uh, I suppose, backlash, you could call it, people sort of going back the other way and sort of, fighting against it and saying it's ridiculous and saying it's absurd and it does do and we'll dig into some of the specifics in a second but what is your sort of give us a bit of a summary I suppose for those who don't know the the game changes is is a documentary that came out recently it's got some big heavy hitter names behind it promoting the idea that a vegan diet is superior to all other diets and that there's there's some some science they showed that was quite compelling some others that's been cherry-picked and sort of biased and some sampling that's a little interesting there as well which we'll talk about in a sec Um, but it's basically showing that a plant-based diet is a superior option for athletes. Dom, give us some thoughts on that. Yes, it's um, it's interesting. I, I think I'll start by saying that it was a, a really um, engaging documentary to watch. Really well made, yeah. Very, very well made. Um, and I think that that's where a lot of the interest has obviously come from. When it comes to the vegan diet, if um, I have nothing against the vegan diet, put it that way, okay? I think that you can actually perform well. I think you can be healthy following a vegan diet. Um, It needs to be done well, which we'll get into throughout this podcast. The issue for me is just the way that the information was presented. Mm. Um, Being a scientist myself, um, I think it was quite a bias for you on on the topic and didn't really show the evidence in the other direction as well and and almost gave the impression that, um, you know, to be elite you need to be vegan as we just had that conversation of how that 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 was. Yes, and... um, and that's not the case. Um, I think that it, it should have shown um, all of the athletes that are not vegan and are performing at their peak. Yeah. And um, we'd have a very long documentary, though, if we then showed that sort of stuff as well. So, yeah. We would. We would. But I think that's what people were forgetting is to actually think about it in a balanced view and understand how it can fit with their lifestyles mm. if that's what they want, but also to, to understand that there are lots of healthy people out there performing um, at their best that are not vegan. Yeah, nice. Josh, we'll throw to, I'll throw to you now. We've, now, apologies to those uh, who are just listening. We've got two sets of headphones, two microphones, and three guests. So we've got a bit of a logistics problem on our hands, but we'll we'll fight our way through and we'll have to do some stuff. So we're, we're passing the mic back and forth as we go. But anyway, so Josh, you've been a vegan for how long now? I actually don't know when I started. I'm thinking at the start of this year. Yep. Um, vegetarian, though, for two years. So two years before that? Uh, one year on top of that, yeah. Okay, cool. So two years total, no meat. Nice. Um, what did you think about the movie? I liked it. Um, I feel like maybe I had a different lens watching it because I didn't need to be convinced on the health or the morals behind it. So I was looking at it more like um, it was crushing those myths of you don't get your protein, you can't have energy, you can't be an athlete if you're vegan. Um, so looking at it as a whole as that's the message they were trying to portray is that you can. Um, I feel like it did a good job of that. Yeah, my, my view, so Josh and I, I'm vegetarian. Josh is a, a full vegan. Um, I've been vegetarian for about three years now, so a similar sort of time frame. When I went into the movie, what I really enjoyed about it and what I really liked um, is a few things, but mainly was that it sort of rebranded veganism. Yeah. So a yeah. lot of the times you think of veganism, you think of people at animal rights protests, you think about people chaining themselves to trees. And so you, you think yeah. of kind of hippies and yeah. stuff like that, which is yeah. which is sometimes correct because that, that is a bit of a stereotype that exists. But what I liked about the movie, and we'll talk about what I did in a second, but what I liked was that it re is like you can be a vegan and you can be a badass. Yeah. You can do really cool things and be vegan. What I didn't like so much, and we'll go back to Dom on this now in a second, is they made it seem like, and as someone who is a vegetarian, this is – this is where they lied a lot, is they made it seem like vegan is easier and it is the only answer. Josh, if you want to pass that mic back across, Dom, I'd like yes. you to get your thoughts on that because from, from a veganism and a vegetarianism rebrand point of view and they are better in a lot of ways environmentally, 
morally, ethically, all those kind of things, there are a lot of benefits to being vegan. But what they made it seem like it was like, well, it is the only answer. It's the only reason you're not in the Olympics is because you're not a vegan. Correct. That's exactly what they made it sound like. Um, and I think we all know that that's, um, that's not the case. And you guys would be the ones to tell me um, more so because I haven't experienced um, veganism myself. But if we go, if we actually look at um, the science behind it and what we need macronutrient wise and, and what, what type of nutrients are in our food, going vegan is not easy. If you do it well, um, it is not easy. If you yep. don't do it well, um, you know, it, it may feel easy, but you're obviously going to be lacking a fair bit of nutrition. So, and, and a lot of those deficiencies kind of creep up on you. Yep. So you might uh, watch the movie, be inspired, go vegan and not notice anything for a month. But what you notice over the next six months is just slowly your B12, your vitamin D, calcium, iron, all these things kind of creep down because you're eating a whole lot of mashed potatoes now and not as much of your you know, seafood and things like that. And all of a sudden, you're actually quite deficient in a lot of things. And you haven't noticed a performance decrement because it happened 1% of the day, 1% of the time just crept up and all of a sudden you're 10% more, you know, lower on things. And that's how things like anemia start. And then those sort of things can become serious problems and tricky to reverse as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, these days everyone lives such busy lifestyles and this is the same for a meat-based diet as well, don't get me wrong, but everyone lives such busy lifestyles and we know that we're often looking for convenient options for food in general. I think the issue is that when you look at the convenient options of vegan-based food can actually be quite unhealthy and quite processed, quite full of saturated fats, sugars, um, refined carbohydrates. So for me that that was the thing that I think needs to be addressed is how you actually do this properly yeah. and what that requires. Which is what we're going to finish off today's episode with. We're going, to, we're going to talk about Josh and my case study of being vegetarian and vegan, how we got to that, and then we'll talk about, and hopefully you'll give us a little bit of a free consult today and sort of work out what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and what people can do to sort of troubleshoot. But I think you're, you made a really good point there, and we'll, we'll throw to Josh in a second, is um, when it comes to they talked about veganism and plant-based diet, and they talked about it as absolute. So you had to be completely vegan or you were a full you know, T-Rex level carnivore. And what the, what the people who you know the people who have been sort of protesting and, and fighting against game changes and game changes have sort of put themselves in camps. It's like it's all plants or it's all meat. And it's like actually the you know ninety nine percent of the population lives somewhere in the spectrum in between between eating a little bit of meat, no meat, some meat, or you know people on sort of like ketogenic diets where they're eating an enormous amount of meat. But the big thing they said is they talked about you know they sort of made this argument that vegan is a synonym for healthy. And Josh. I know I can be a vegan and a vegetarian without being healthy. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that, about I suppose when you're in sports science, when you're in this sort of field and dietetics and things like that, it's quite easy to feel like you're eating lazily because of how much you know in this space. But I think relative to the average athlete, the average you know office worker, whoever it might be, for their, their level of knowledge to eat well vegan does take quite a little more effort. Yeah. Um, so I had a good friend of mine that tried vegan Um I hope she knows that I'm talking about her. I hope she gets embarrassed. She <laughs> don't name her though. That's a that's a bit mean. That's a, but she knows. Um, she decided. Yeah, I'll, like we all went vegan. She's like, oh, I'll try it with you. I'll go I'll, vegan for you a and week. your you and your partner Renee are both yep. vegans. And do you have some friends who are also um, yeah a few friends that have gone vegan as well yep. in the same time frame. Um, she thought she'd jump on board, try it for a week, and what she did was she lived off potato chips and two minute noodles. And at the end of it, she's like, it's not working for me. I was like, you're an idiot. Like, <laughs> you've missed the point. Like, you got to know what you're doing. What, what you're going to sub your protein in for, uh, for different meals. Um, yeah, where, do you, where are you getting all your nutrients from? And making sure you're eating a variety of protein sources as well because yeah. animal pro the one big benefit of animal protein is it's a complete protein. Yeah. So if, Dom, you want to touch on this as well, but with proteins, amino acids are – there's nine essential ones that you need from food um, – I'm just waffling now, Dom. It's probably better if you just – protein. Talk about protein. And one yes. thing the movie does actually – sorry, before you go, is they, they talk about protein being a source of energy. Now, it is a source of energy potentially, but it's not the body's preferred source and it's more of a building block. Absolutely. I think that's a key point that um, for those of you that watched the movie, you will know that they spoke about that as saying that, you know, that um, – the meat-based diet uses protein as an energy source, whereas the vegan-based diet uses carbohydrates, and that's where the problem is. Um, I think that that's completely not true. Again, it's saying if you um, have a standard, follow a standardised meat-based diet, then you're relying purely on meat, which is not the case. Yeah, exactly. No one's eating a purely carn carnivorous diet. There are some in that camp, but that's oh, there also are really? oh, absolutely yes. How's They're, that working for them? Um, if you act, there's some fantastic um, podcasts around where there are some very experienced 
experienced and uh, credentialed people around the globe that are following the carnivore diet and um, measuring what? their bloods for years and are saying that it's the way to go. So that's the other camp. Eating 100%. I didn't. So, oh, I've, so uh, I experimented with a lot of diets through uni and mm. stuff like that when you have a lot of time in your training. One diet that I stumbled across that I did for I think a day and a half was the steak and eggs diet. Yeah. Pretty much that's what it is. Hardly, maybe a little bit of broccoli here and there if you listen to, oh, I'll pass you on the, the details. It's quite fascinating. But, right, okay, but so they're on go. that side of the camp saying that inflammatory markers, et cetera, are, are lower and blah, blah, blah. Wow, Sorry. okay, there you go. There we go. But back kids, to kids the- though, kids, <laughs> quick disclaimer from myself and from Dom, do not do a carnivorous diet no. for your sake or for the environment. We don't want to do that at all. Um but if you're going back to talking about the protein and carbohydrates, I mean, I work with a lot of athletes, um, you know, AFL, basketball. I would always suggest that they have carbohydrates to fuel. That's what mm-hmm. they need. Okay, so so we know that we our, our primary fuel source is always carbohydrates. When we talk about protein, particularly, sorry, you're working no. AFL and AFLW with Geelong ramping up into preseason yep. for the women's anaerobic sports. That's 100% carbohydrate. Like you can't do repeat sprint work unless you've got glycogen in the tank. Absolutely. When you're doing that explosive sort of movements, you can't, which is why even things like the keto diet, which mm. is, you know, very low carbohydrates, I wouldn't be suggesting that for an athlete, you know, in those types of sports um, when they're about to perform because it's just not the right energy source. Mm-hmm. Um But saying that, back to the the protein conversation, so yes, animal proteins have got complete protein, which means that they're giving you all of the the essential amino acids. Nine? Nine. Nine of them. Which you, there's 20 altogether, um, and you can't get that from, um, uh, you have to get that from food. So there's 20 total, 11 of them your body can process and synergize from from the things we eat. Absolutely. But those nine you have to specifically eat, so leucine is a great example. You have to eat leucine to get leucine into your body. Tryptophan's another one, I believe. Tryptophan's another one. Really important for bodybuilding, growth and repair, yeah. hormone balance, things like that, that if you're not consuming some form of food with leucine, over time you'll get leucine depleted and have some trouble. Absolutely. Now, where the – not the issue, but where it can get challenging on a vegan-based diet is that plant-based food is not complete in that same way. You tend to need to have complementary proteins, which means what you can do is get the mix of different types of food to make sure that you are still meeting those nine essential amino acids. Mm. The other um, issue is that they don't have the same uh, biological value as well, which right. means they're not as easily absorbed. They're not in as high of, of um, a content. When we talk about plant-based proteins? Plant-based proteins. Is that because of the fibre content? Uh, is that's a part of it. Because fibre is essential for our body. And was your stat the other day, Josh, 97% of people? 97% of Australians are not meeting their daily fibre. Yep. And so fibre is a really big deal from a general health point of view. Um, but- when it comes to plant-based proteins, Dom, with that fibre content, does that kind of – because I know that uh, blocks – is iron absorption as well? Fibre can interrupt that? It can, it can. And, and that's a part of it as well. Uh, but it's just the fact that it just doesn't actually have the same amount in the, the plant-based sources as, as a broad um, uh, perspective. Yep. So that's where the issue can be sometimes because to meet the, the same amount of protein, which is important, I'm talking – I have an athlete lens on. Mm. More so, okay. I think general population, yes, all that general population need is their one gram per kilo of protein um, to meet their recommendations. Now, that's, that's that's your baseline recommendation. So one gram. So if you're a ninety yeah. kilo athlete, you need ninety grams a day. That's for general population, mm-hmm. right? That's what our our dietary recommendations tell us. Athletes are more than that um, as a minimum. Athletes, depending on the type, should probably be at around the one point two to one point five grams per kilo. Okay, so it's not that much more though. You often hear people talk about two and a half grams and yes. stuff like that. Is that getting a little too high? Well, it's not because that's that's the minimum that you need. But then it's a different conversation if you start talking about the optimum amount of protein. Okay, right. when when you've got certain goals and whether that be um, you know to gain muscle, whether that be if you're on an energy um, budget, so you're trying to restrict energy, say to make weight or um, or to know, stay lean if you do a running lean. based sport. Yep. Um, protein requirements increase. Uh, if we think about what uh, AFL players have, you know, we've done studies at the club, both the boys and the girls, and both are having upwards of that two gram per kilo. There's new research to show that you, you know, up to three, three and a half gram per kilo per uh, for athletes is actually increasing, um, you know, muscle recovery, synthesis, etc. So. That's where yeah. the issue can be from a vegan-based diet because it's quite hard to meet that amount. It's quite tricky to do it efficiently. Josh, where do you get your protein from? 
Because it's the number. It's the number one question. You're a vegetarian. Number one. How do you get your protein? <laughs> um, well, the the best trick I learned is if you complement legumes with whole grains, you get a whole protein source. Right. If I'm correct. Um, and so, like for breakfast, I'll have my peanut butter jelly on toast. Yep. So that's complete protein. So you got nut peanuts, Even which though, are a legume, and yep. your whole grain toast. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Um, for lunch, it could be usually leftover dinners, so pasta, stir fry, rice, curry, things like that. Um, and I'd usually sub in for the protein would be chickpeas, lentils, beans, tofu, tempeh, that sort of thing to get that protein profile. Yeah, nice. I'm, I'm similar. So, uh, uh, yeah, breakfast varies a lot, but sometimes so, some form of muesli, usually with a coconut yogurt or a Greek yogurt, something like that. Uh, and then lunch is the same thing. Yep. Beans, legumes, tofu, whole grains, quinoa, things along those lines. Sorry, just wanted to add to that. That's the sort of food that you need, um, definitely. And, you know, legumes is a huge source of protein, um, tofu, tempeh, etc. I think what we just have to remember, unlike um, meat-based sources of protein, majority of plant-based are also a carbohydrate. Exactly. Okay. That's kind of what I was heading with that. Exactly. So they've got yeah. high fiber content, they've got protein, yeah. but then they've also got carbohydrates. So like you yeah. mentioned, if you're on a calorie what do you call it? A calorie calorie budget, uh, calorie energy budget, budget yeah. or in, um, energy restricted. Yeah, so you, maybe you're not training as much, maybe you're injured, or maybe you just kind of. Yeah. If you're eating all those legumes, yes, you're getting 15 grams or 20 grams of protein in a big serve, but you're also getting 60, 80, maybe 100 grams of carbs as well. Absolutely, and that might not be a problem. That may not be an issue dependent on the person and their activity levels. If you are um, a recreational athlete, say that just likes to train hard, I think we're all in that category. Yep. We're not. We're, we're not going right to, um, <laughs> to the Olympics. Anytime soon, um, and your diet maybe wasn't uh, great before, or as good as it could have been, and you go to a plant-based diet and actually improves, then you're going to see some good benefit. Yeah. The issue, not the issue, but that's, the, that's a big part of the placebo. I think is sometimes people do that, and all of a sudden they're eating more salads, they're absolutely. eating more veggies, they're eating more lentils, and those things are giving the fiber, which is creating a you know less potential inflammation, not because of the, the lack of meat, but because the increase in fiber has exactly. these benefits, which is fantastic, which is a great outcome. I guess what we, um, what I need to consider when I'm working with the athletes that I do is that most of them, if they listen to what I say, have come from a pretty good baseline anyway, mm. and a lot of that is quite rich in protein without the carbohydrate source. Lean protein source. So, Lean so protein. Quite calorie efficient. Absolutely. Now, if we switched all of that to plant-based um, proteins to get the requirements that they need protein-wise, I'm not sure what would happen to body comp, but I would suspect it would change and probably gain some body fat if training didn't change as well, purely because of the change in macros. Josh, how many grams of protein do you eat a day? Don't measure it. I'm don't, not sure. Don't measure. Yeah. I'm around 1 to 1.1 gram. Usually I – every time – I train like six days a week, so, you know, run or lift or whatever it is, and I would have a protein substitute, like a protein supplement of some sort on that day, whether it be whey because I'm, I'm vegetarian, not vegan, so I'm allowed to eat dairy products by my by whatever rules it was. I just suddenly set myself for some reason. <laughs> um, so I, I have either a whey protein or sometimes a pea or sometimes I'll, I'll mix them and I'll have a blend, so yeah. like sort of cut them between so it's – slightly vegan, a semi-vegan protein, I suppose you call it, but I still get my amino acids that way. Um, but I'll have 20, 20 or so grams there, sort of like a booster to get me across the line every day. I would say um, I eat less protein now having been vegetarian and vegan for three-ish years. I have a theory. You're going to tell me I'm wrong, but I have a theory that my body is doing a better job. in an, And as this is this is not for athletes. This is a recreational athlete, someone who runs and lifts for fun and to stay healthy point of view. I have a theory that my body is more efficient with the protein I feed it because I'm having less, so my body's kind of doing a better job of absorbing it because I do eat better quality food now, a lot more less, lot less processed stuff than I used to. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in that? Or is that just my placebo? Um, my, my, cause, because my body comp's actually got better. I've mm -hmm, lost, mm -hmm. lost probably three kilos since I've been vegetarian. Uh, my body comp is really stable and I can have a bad weekend of eating or bad couple of weeks of eating and I don't notice my body changes as much as it used to. Yeah, so I probably can't answer that without really understanding what your diet was like before, what your diet lots is like of protein. now. Uh, lots meat of, three times a day, yeah. two and a half grams of protein, just meat and eggs and lots of like bodybuilder type pro program. Yeah, so it could come down as well. I'm assuming that not only protein but probably energy has changed a fair bit. Less calories in total, Less yeah. calories in total, I'm exactly. less obsessive about my eating and training now yeah. this year. 
So I think that the reduction in weight is probably more related to the change in energy that more sense, so yeah. than the change in protein. Yeah. As far as using the protein more efficiently, um, there's probably there's not a whole lot in that except okay. the fact that some people – and that, and it, it's a fair assessment. They say they feel sluggish after eating a lot of meat. They feel like they can't digest meat properly. Because, yeah, one of the double-edged swords of meat consumption is that it's, uh, it's lower GI. So it slows down digestion, which keeps yeah. you full flung. It has a very big satiety effect. Josh, looks like you want to say something though. Um, but the other side of that is, yeah, it sits in your stomach longer. So it sits in your gut longer. So if, in terms of like pre-game, you probably don't want a heavy, big steak before you go out and play. Although Michael Jordan used to have a big steak and cob salad before every game. All his teammates were on pasta and the, the nutritionist that the club were on, and he was like, no, nah, I have my steak. Anyway. I didn't know that. That's, um, that's, <laughs> all I was going to add to that was anecdotal. Yeah, like um, one of the big changes I've – had and what I would tell people when they asked me what I felt when I changed is like after dinner like I don't feel so sluggish like I just need to sit down and just be a potato for a while like I feel like I've still got some energy and like I can move around I can work out late if I want to as opposed to when I was eating meat for dinner yeah I'm just gonna Sorry, I was just going to add to that as well that I think... We'll we'll fix this mic situation next time we have a (laughs) three-person... It's fun. Um, (laughs) um, No, I think we we need to understand the difference in types of meat as well. Yeah, that's... Thank you so much. We missed that point before when talking about the movie is... They like they they class everything as you know they, they they make everything siloed. You're either a vegan or you're a carnivore. It's like no, every diet is plant based. If you look at the calorie calorie sources in eighty percent of the diets probably dominant you see, they're still plant based. Wheat is a plant, oats are a plant, rice is a plant. There's more grams of that and calories from that than there are from meats. It's just there's meat on top to get that protein boost and all those other benefits. And so this idea that's like you know everyone's either vegan or carnivore, and it's the same with meats. They talk about like. All meat goes over here, and there is such a big difference between salami and you know strads and things you get in the deli and organic grass-fed steaks. Absolutely, and there's even a difference between organic grass-fed steaks and salmon mm. and lean chicken. And so, when you talk about that sluggish feeling, and when I when I speak to athletes about that and find out a bit more, it really is more the red meat that does that to them, right. more so than than eating the fish or eating so you know a lean chicken breast. Right. Um, and what is it in meat in red meat specifically that gives them that? Uh, a lot of the times, it can be the saturated fat content yeah. that can really slow down digestion, um, and that's probably the main thing that that would just make them feel like that. Yeah. And then it comes down to the quantity. As as well, I mean, a lot of uh, athletes that I see eat a lot of the meat, so their their you know portion sizes are pretty big. Yeah, that's a big part of it too. We don't need a lot of meat to get what we need from it because it's so efficient from a calorie point of view. Because it's so efficient, exactly. It's you know it is high protein, um, high in protein. It is high in iron. So you know I'm actually a, a believer that we need. Protein and we need it from meat-based sources, but we could probably significantly red, reduce our red meat and get it from other sources. Um, which Diversify, may, yeah. Exactly, which may actually tick some of these boxes as well. Yeah, nice, nice. Did you, no, you didn't have anything to throw? Sorry, Josh. Um, one thing I think we should we should talk about now, which is uh, I want to start with you, Josh, is talk about our – because some people, people have been coming up to us and asking how we do it how they can do it, what's the what's the solution, what's their answer. And, Dom, I thought this would be a chance where you could sort of just pick our diets apart potentially or give us heaps of praise because we're doing it so nicely, probably more the, the former than the latter. Um, but, Josh, I'd just like to hear about how you went about your transition into being a vegan yeah. through vegetarian and, and what sort of start you think on that is. This is a good chance to talk potentially about the environmental and ethical things outside of yeah, okay. performance, I think, as well. And then – before we head on from that, Dom, maybe you might have some ideas on what we are doing well, what we aren't doing well um, for people who are either at the same stage as us, moving towards more plant-based foods, reducing their meat content, maybe they've gone full vegan, how they can do it better. So how do you do yours, Josh? Um, well, I was lucky enough to be with Renee, who's been vegan for as long, like five plus years, I think, um, vegetarian for years before that. Um, so whenever I go out with dinner with her, go to a family house, I'm always getting the vegetarian vegan meals anyway. So I was pretty accustomed to the the taste and like. And you guys have been together for a while, haven't you? Yeah, ten years last week. Congratulations! <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, and yeah, so I was always around it, always like enjoyed the taste, that sort of stuff. Um, but then with my family growing up, I'd be having the meat and three 
edge. Pretty traditional plate. sort of Aussie, yeah, yeah, Aussie exactly. menu. Yep. Um, and so I think the transition happened. I went over on a snow trip with Bounce when I was working with them. Um, and the some people had put forward their dietary requirements being vegetarian. Um, I didn't put myself forward. Uh, and every time we got to mealtime, lunch, dinner, I would go line up for the vegetarian meals because I'd get seconds and I would get to it first, whereas everyone's lining up for ah. me. It's like, I eat a lot. Like I, just a logistics and greed-based yeah, thing. I was just like, I'm going to be efficient here. I'm going to get two meals. I'm going to go to the vegetarian. So I went vegetarian for the trip just because I was greedy. Um, came home, kept it up and realized it's been a week. I hadn't eaten meat. And I felt fine. I was like, I'll keep it going. And then that's what the transition was. But like for years before that, I was having the – the vegetarian meals with Renee when I was around her. So you're yeah. already kind of sub- immersed in exactly that environment yeah. in that way of eating. It's yeah. like constantly being educated on the the morals, the ethics, the environment from her anyway. So I was pretty, yeah, um, exposed to it earlier. Nice. What did you notice in the? I suppose I suppose that first three months initially after going from eating meat, what sounds like pretty normal rates, maybe a little less because of Renee, mm. into becoming a full vegetarian. Did you notice any difference? Or oh, you, do you have any concerns going into that? No concerns at all. Um, Differences, nothing really stood out. I maybe lost three kilos body weight. I wasn't tracking um, how much I was eating or how much I weighed or anything like that. Just over time, I realized I'd drop down to X amount. Um, but then, did, funny, you, did you did your training change at all during that time? No, nah, uh, still playing basketball. Didn't feel like I was running out of energy throughout that. Slept fine. Um, still hitting the weights three times a week, roughly. Um, and then the funny thing is, then this year going vegan, I've gone the opposite way. Still not tracking what I eat or what I weigh. I'm now at the heaviest I've ever been, which is just like funny enough. And not to say that they're related. It's just like I can put on my size still being vegan. Yes. Yeah. You've had a pretty good training year this year, actually. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? <laughs> like what I'm doing for training? Yeah, like because I've been watching you train. We don't train together that often. But every time it's like, damn, got to keep up with Josh. <laughs> Well, I'm just trying to keep up with Pat. <laughs> um, nah, recently we set some goals, uh, me, Meg and Pat. Um, so I've just been chasing them down, trying to get to two times body weight on the squat, uh, 150 core lift, the blues on the bench because Pat's at the blues. I really want that. Um, and a 70 centimetre vertical. And I'm just slowly closing in. Nice. Yeah. And you haven't felt like vegan has inhibited you at all, held you back from any Not of that? Not at all. Not at all. And are you trying to eat more calories to gain the muscle to lift the weights? No. No, just eating when you're hungry. Just eating when I'm hungry, and but the thing is, I'm usually always hungry. <laughs> <laughs> nice, um, different story to my experience. Sim- similar in a lot of ways in that we did it. We both have done it gradually. Mm-hmm. For me, I just started wrestling more and more with the ethical and the environmental side of things. Watched a few documentaries. This is three years ago now. Watched a few documentaries and started thinking. I was like. And like, there was also a budgetary issue. I was, you know, just finished uni, didn't have enormous amounts of cash. And it's like, meat it costs this much a kilo. I can eat these instead. That costs, I was just doing some, I like maths, I like numbers. So I was just working out how much it would cost. And it worked out that a vegan or vegetarian diet was going to be cheaper. And so I was like, I can't know these things about the environmental and the ethical mm. and the moral side of things. I can't, I can't love dogs and pat every dog I see at the park and then go, no, it's okay to eat lamb. Because yep. lambs are also adorable and cute. And so it became that. And then it became learning more about the methane and the environment and the effect that, you know, the pastures required to feed the animals that then feed us. It becomes like, well, the whole the middleman argument is a bit incomplete because animals have a different digestive system, a different microbiome and all these things. So they the way they digest plants and convert it into animal tissue and protein is not the same way we could go out like a cow and eat grass and get our protein. That thing's too simplified. But the idea that you know we farm corn and soy and then feed that to the cows to then feed the humans, the amount of protein and water required to feed the animals to then feed the humans seems like a bit of an mm. inefficient middleman because the amount of meat we're eating as Western society, the rate we're eating it, the way we're farming it is a very much a historical anomaly. We've always eaten meat. That's part of how we got our big brains because we had the extra calories because of cooking and all that sort of thing. But the way it's been industrialized and the way we're now using animals literally as machines where we get it, chickens. And what was that stat? There was that video we watched. There's another really good uh, documentary. It's a shorter one called Expl- uh, Explain. The, Fu- the Future of Meat. Did you watch that one, Dom? Very interesting stuff talking about how we've genetically modified our chickens so they grow so fast that they can't actually live much beyond six months because their legs can't hold up their enormous muscles because they've been bred for greater muscle for feeding humans. So it became this thing where it's like, I can't know those things and consciously eat the meat and be okay with myself. That became very much a, a, a conflict inside me. And so I was just like, all right, I'll only buy meat that's reduced for quick sale. So I, I yeah, stopped okay. eating 
like buying meat that was fresh and so like not I'm not eating off meat that <laughs> sounds like I'm just <laughs> picking meat out of bins I'm not doing that you know how the supermarkets have a thing where it's reduced so you buy those ones instead so I'd do that and then it was like became a thing where I was like okay I wonder what will change I'm nervous I'm going to be tired I'm nervous I'm going to be weak I'm nervous I'm not going to sleep as well nothing changed yeah I was the same body weight. I was lifting the same weights. I was running the same speeds. I was sleeping the same amount. I had the same amount of energy and focus. I was like, oh. So this whole thing of I need the meat Mm. was not like the meat helps, but it's not essential for me. But I did it very strategically. So I did it like, you know, down to three times a week, down to two times a week, down to once a week, and then eventually went no meat. And now I'm at the moment where I'm probably about 90% of the way to being a vegan. Yeah, I think that's one of the key points like coming from the movie is it has to be gradual. Um, it's not like a 180 degree thing. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently, uh, Plant Proof with Dr. Will Bulsowitz. I hope I pronounced that right. I'll write all these links down. We'll, we'll put them in the show notes as um, well. I think he was talking about like it takes 28 days for like your gut microbiome to change like when you change your diet. So like um, it, it has to be a gradual thing. Like if you just do it instantly, your gut microbiome is going to hate that and it's going to fight that. And you're like your friend's feel, experience. Right, exactly. Don't do two-minute noodles and chips. Yeah. Dom, do you want to talk a bit about the microbiome? I think that's a it's, it's, that deserves its whole own podcast sometime in the future. I think we'll be here all day. Just yeah. give, give us a, a, a sixty second summary of what it is, why it matters, and how much we are learning about it right now. It's like such a new area. It, it's a hugely new area. Um, I think we each have our uh, very individual gut microbiome. Um, and it can. What we're learning is just how important the gut microbiome is for things like our well-being, um, uh, anxiety, depression, all of those sorts mm. of, of situations as well. Is it eighty percent of your serotonin is produced in your stomach? Seventy. Absolutely. So the gut controls a lot um, and we know that the gut microbiome is actually very responsive to what we put in it um, and it can either – it can change quite quickly, very much based on um, carbohydrates is a big thing that can right. affect the gut microbiome. But, again, we're really learning about – like at the moment there's lots of testing that can look at your own gut microbiome and then can just can say, oh, because it looks like this, you should have this sort of diet. Right, like the blood type diets? Absolutely. We do not know enough about it yet, um, to be honest, to really – really uh, say that, that that that's the case. Um, we're really learning about it, but it, we know just how important it is. Mm. Yeah, so it plays a really big role. And so, yeah, and so if you're going to make dietary changes, also from a sociological point of view and from a temptations and dealing with cravings, things like that, but also just physically from a gut microbiome, if you cut out all your meat or all your dairy, mm. those specific cultures in our stomach that were suited to having this much milk a day and this much meat a day, they're going to freak out a bit. Absolutely. I did want to touch on something that you mentioned that I think is a yeah, really so, important so that's, point. So that's how Josh and I went about it. Oh, o- sorry. Open, <laughs> open, no, open, open, <laughs> open slab that. Tell us, tell us how we did. No, tell yeah. us what you um, think. Well, firstly, firstly, just a point I wanted to make where you said that and both of you that you didn't notice that much of a difference, right? So it's good. Like, and you did it for moral reasons, mm-hmm. uh, for environmental reasons. And well, it started environmental for me and then became a bit more moral because it was like how can I love dogs and murder cows yeah. and lambs. Yeah. yeah, and totally understand that. And and so that's great. And, and you changed and you still felt great. You may have lost some body weight but still able to do what you wanted to do to live life healthily, to train, etc. I think that's crucial that you didn't notice any detriment but whether there was a massive gain in performance. To no. The, right? And, and I think that that's important for people because the questions that I've been getting from athletes is – Will this help me perform better? Um, and just to quickly go back to the documentary, no, that's yeah. That is the impression that it gave. That yeah, that is the big flaw. Is it makes it look like. And when I was when I went to the cinema, I watched it from a vegan's point of view. Mm-hmm. And I was like, someone who's a vegetarian thinking about becoming more vegan. I watched it from that point of view as this lens of ah, oh, people can be badass and be vegan. Like cool, okay, yeah. that's great. Like, but then also now I've watched it a second. I watched it again last night for recap for today watching again i watch it with more of my scientist hat on and then through some of the filters of some of the people who sort of looked at some of the different parts of it it's like they made it sound so easy mm. and having gone through that myself it is not easy and trying to eat less vegetarian like because going v ve- uh, going from a, a normal diet balanced diet to a vegetarian diet is actually pretty easy yeah you can still have eggs you can still have your coffees you're pretty fine there but what i'm noticing is going more towards a vegan diet is like like if you if you're ninety percent of the way there by being a vegetarian, that last ten percent 
is like 10 times harder than the first 90 percent absolutely because it's like oh no sorry that bread's got milk in it oh yeah. sorry that thing's got an egg powder in it yeah. oh that that thing's got whey in the bottom it's like oh my god there are so many things as absolutely. soon as it touches a factory there's a chance it's got some plant product in it uh, animal product rather yeah, totally. And so I just think that's a really, really crucial point is that if you're trying to do this to think it's the, you know, magic uh, thing to make you perform silver bullet, better, yeah. um, that is not the case. And and so, you know, you can do it well um, and we'll get on to, to that and, and, you know, making sure that you actually have the help to do it. Um, you can do it well and you can perform just as good but you're not going to be, you know, winning any more gold medals yeah, just because not, you've gone vegan. <laughs> it was not the difference between me going and making the NBA. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm performing the same. I feel good. And the thing with the documentary is they made it sound like all these athletes were performing so much better because they'd gone vegan. But what you forget about, and this is the, I'll put my strength and conditioning hat on, is during that time they were still doing progressive overload and periodizing and training their, their asses off and supplementing Absolutely. and sleeping and doing all that stuff. So the super compensation cycle through most athletes' career continues up and up. Peak somewhere between 25 and 35, but it continues up and up and up. And all these athletes, save for a couple, were in the peak of their career, went vegan, and their peak got extended. What's to say that wouldn't have happened had they just eaten more veggies and continued eating meat? Who knows? And I would love to know what supplementation some of um, the the athletes on the show were on. Yeah. Um, I think that we just have to remember that if you are vegan and training at that level, supplementation is is going to be needed more than likely. Well, you, know, you, you even mentioned that you'll have your whey-based proteins yeah. and um, after training and whatnot. And I don't know if you have any supplements. Um, uh, yeah, I'd have um, B12 because – Yep. We've spoken on B12. We have not touched on B12 um, yet. So B12 is found naturally in soil um, and it is artificially injected into meat and so meat eaters get it through their meat as a middleman. Um, so it's important for central nervous system, I believe. So en- Energy production as well, Dom? Dom's, Dom's yeah. nodding. She doesn't have a mic, but she's, she's nodding along. Um, so I have that as a supplement because you're going to need that. Um, protein, I'm having protein shakes, uh, magnesium as you well. You go with a... a- Pea, pea and rice blend, which gives that you makes the complete source. Yeah. Nice work. Yep. Um, what else? With iron, you've got to be careful of your iron. So um, I think the movie touched on heme iron being only in animal products. Um, non-heme iron is in plant products. So it's not ab- absorbed as well. As and Dom's doing a lot of nodding here. It's, it's because of the fibre effectively. Fibre blocks and slows yeah, down yeah. iron um, absorption. And non-heme is therefore always with fibre. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, – Non-heme from plants you have to have with certain things to get it better absorbed. So from what I understand, things like broccoli, um, carrot, onion, garlic. I think I've read some Vitamin C. Vitamin C, vitamin C and iron are uh, best friends. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think I've read something that onion and garlic, if you have that with your non-heme, it increases the absorption rate by 73%, I believe. Cool. Yeah. So just knowing things like that as well as what things to supplement when you go vegan is yeah. crucial. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so I- I think it's just that's an important piece to remember is that and you know, most athletes I work with that are meat-based are also on supplements just yeah. because at that elite level you, yeah. you know that they require it. But you high, can high, One thing I think that is often missed is high performance isn't always healthy. Like you are pushing your body to the extreme in a lot of those cases and so you need – Every ounce, every minute of sleep, every second in the ice bath, you need every single massage, you need every gram of protein to make sure you're pushing your body to the absolute limit. That may not necessarily be the best thing to get your body to 100 years old, but if you want to win championships, you want to win premierships, you want to be a Brownlow medalist, you got to push, push your body. That's the whole point. But I think the difference is if I had, um, you know, one of the, um, the players say to me, oh, Dom, I really don't want to use – um, supplementation anymore. I don't want to use a protein shake um, after strength or after footy training uh, and they were meat-based, I would be much more comfortable to say we can do that with food. Okay, yep. We can get in certain dairy products to get that whey protein and we can, you know, and, and we could meet it. Um, I yeah, would good, be more good, concerned. Good we, could, we, we, we can meet it. it. Yeah, nice. Well done. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'd be more concerned from a if it was a vegan saying I don't want to use supplements at that elite level um, because I don't. I, I question if you could get in what you need purely based on the food. Yeah, without interruption from fibre and things exactly like that. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I've lost my train of thought. It's important there as well to note that when we, t- we and Don, we need to sit down soon and do a, a full supplement episode, which is f- yes. far beyond today's episode. And we, we sell supplements here at Corange, only the ones we believe in and ones that are batch tested for ASADA reasons and things like that. And you're going to talk about it more in this is we're filming this before the nutrition seminar, which is happening tonight. You'll talk more about supplements there and you'll be able to find that video again linked in the show notes. Um, it's a big thing, supplementation. People get all very, oh, you're, you don't need extra. It's like protein shakes. They're just protein. It's just the protein part of dairy or the protein part of pea or part of rice taken out and put into a powder. They're effectively just concentrated food. Like people get very – they put supplements in the sort of the drugs and the illicit category, but they're really not. Oh, absolutely. I, I completely agree. Uh, I think it comes down to what your philosophy is on whole food and there are some people mm. that that's their thing, same as, you know, veganism is other people's and keto is others some people just want just whole food based diets and if that's the case again we can make it happen it's just Mm. going to be more difficult if you're training at that elite level normal recreational train you know people we could probably do it easier but at that elite level who i tend to work with it it can be difficult without it Mm. i was watching the game changes again for the second time last night to get my my notes for today Uh, and i was watching with my girlfriend amanda and we're sitting there and she goes you could really just substitute all this plant-based stuff for unprocessed couldn't you in terms of more veggies more whole grains less things that have come out of factories less things that are in enormous amounts of packaging like in a nutshell that's kind of the best place to start with a good diet totally um there's no question like if you Um, want a silver bullet it's like if it doesn't look like it could grow or walk probably don't eat it exactly right we don't eat enough plants full stop we need to eat more plants so that is not a question Everyone needs to be slightly more plant based. It's when they go yes. only plant based. Exactly where they're, and if, again, you, it can it can work for you, you know. But it that's when some of the challenges start to happen. But if we all increase the amount of plants that we eat, then we would be, um, you know, doing a good thing for our for our health, for the environment, um, and and everything else that we've spoken about. Exactly. Mm. Okay, so let's let's start wrapping this thing up. People have watched The Game Changers. They've watched the other and listened to some of the show notes and resources we've connected, including Lane uh, Norton's fantastic mm. pull apart of The Game Changers where he sort of – and he has his own biases as well um, and he, there's some parts where he cherry But the thing, with, the thing with documentaries is they need to be truthful. They need to tell the fact. But they can't tell a complete story and they can't be balanced because they'll be 10 hours long and you'll just leave it more confused than when you walked in. So they have agendas. They have things they want to hit and that's kind of – part of it. Often we think of documentaries like, oh, yeah, that documentary lied to me. It didn't lie. It just selected a narrative. So it's somewhere between fact and storytelling is the tricky thing. And so what my first recommendation for people is don't base your diet completely on one documentary. That's crazy. I watched, I think, all of them on Netflix before I even started thinking about it. So I was like, I'm going to watch them all, just balance view, see what they all think, see the different pros and cons, the moral argument, the environmental argument, the health argument, and see what it all means and then see where I think on that. Um, when it comes to if you are, you've, you've done all those things, you've, you're at that point and you still think that the vegan diet or an a, a, a exclusively plant-based diet is for you, Don, what are your recommendations for people to do it right in order? So first of all, eat more plants in your current diet. Yes, definitely. Um Get some help from a professional, I think, needs to be close to number one uh, because you need to sit down with someone and go through what your lifestyle is like, you know, what your training is like, what your current diet is like to be able to get the best plan for you um, and, and to be able to talk about some of the things that are on your mind and some of the challenges that you might come up with and sort of troubleshoot around them before you get into them. I think that's really important. Yeah, and it's also valuable to get someone else's view because they're going to have an unbiased view on things. You're going to sit there and go, you know, you have that conversation in your head, I want to be vegan. No, I can totally do this. I've definitely got more time to cook my breakfasts and definitely got more time. Definitely, I'll start loving legumes, I swear. Yeah. You need someone like a, an accredited dietitian, like the one we have sitting next to us today, which we're so lucky to have here at Core Advantage. You need someone like that who can look at it from an outside perspective and go, okay, I love your reasons. That's great. Let's. Su- I'm, I'm here. To, I'm not here to tell you you can't. I'm here to tell you you can. But let's do it right. 
Absolutely. And then once you've done that um, and you've decided uh, that's the way I want to go or, or you just want to experiment with being more plant-based, and this is the advice I've given to a handful of um, you know, players that have come to see me about it as well, is I would first understand, well, what are the reasons that you want to do this? And and if it's the fact that, it, let's use an example of some that I've spoken to, where it is more just meat's not quite feeling like it's agreeing with them mm-hmm. um, and, and potentially feeling like it may be um, you know, more of a detriment to performance because they're not feeling like they're quite a, uh, you know, at their best or at their mm-hmm. peak. Then it would be, I'd be saying, well, let's start with that. And if it's red meat, which tends to be the culprit, let's reduce that. You know, let's get in, you know, going from five days a week of red meat of some sort to two days a week. And yeah, let's so re- a, a gradual transition. Yeah, exactly. Nice. And let's replace with not so it doesn't necessarily have to be just plant based protein, but with um, salmon and chicken and eggs. Yeah. So, so rotating through your different protein sources to find what works for you. Absolutely. And then choosing one or two days where, hey, yeah, let's go plant based. Let's go full and, and see how you feel. Meat free Monday. Meat, meat free Monday, exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, cool. I think the dairy is just a, a big one as well. A lot of people don't go well with dairy. Um, mm. it, it can cause stomach upsets. There's a lot of people that are intolerant to lactose, and it just makes them actually feel worse. Um, you know, I think that dairy is also a good place to start because you can substitute for non-dairy sources mm. that still meet your dietary requirements. There are so many different milks, M-Y-L-Ks out exactly. there. And they all play around, find which one works for you, but you will find one that you like. Some are thicker than milk, some are more nutty, some are more creamy, like they're all, some are more watery, like find one that works for you. Absolutely. And you just want to, oh, sorry, you just want to make sure that it's fortified with calcium, which yep. majority of them are. And if that's the case, then you're ticking that. So there's little things that you can do to start to head towards that. Nice. On the milks as well, I watched a video recently that said oat was the best from an environmental point of view. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, save the planet, that's why I'm going to be a vegan, oat milk is the best because it's the crop that has the less effect it's farmed the most efficiently um, like the other i end. just had a quick question on lactose intolerance and stuff like that i've heard that um the genetic mutation that is lactose intolerance it's actually meant to be that we're not meant to tolerate it at all i hope i've said that around the right way so the mutation is if you can tolerate it is that true not that i'm aware of um there are so um lactose is a part of the i get the fodmaps family mm-hmm. Um, FODMAPs are certain sugars uh, that we find in food and there is a couple of those that, that are that way. So there's fructans as an example um, that comes under that category. It's different to fructose. Fructose is also a FODMAP but that's found in fruit. So fructans is found in a lot of our veggies. Um, so onion and garlic and legumes. Uh, we actually, a, a lot of us can't digest um, that particular sugar and if anything that's more the norm. It's just that not everyone gets symptoms from that. Um, lactose is a bit different to that. Yep. I do know uh, that certain um, ethnicities have more trouble with lactose than others. Yes. So I know Caucasians, for example, do great with lactose. Mm. Uh, Asian populations, not so much, and African American populations, even less, I believe. Is that, that true? Yeah, that can have a part to play in it, definitely. And so that comes down to your genetic makeup, but also your gut microbiome is going to be affected by what you've been exposed to as a baby and things like that as well. Um, I did see something interesting the other day talking about that, um, about whether the the dairy industry is racist for pushing that it's dairy for everyone if certain races can't tolerate it as well. I found that very interesting, like probably framed the wrong way, but like if they're pushing it and I think it was like up to 80% of African-Americans can't tolerate it and they're pushing it and making these people sick from it. Um, I found that interesting. Um, I think it was pitched in like they they were doing the food dietary requirements or guidelines for um, the US and they were pitching that they need to remove dairy from the guidelines um, in the States, which I don't think they did, but um, Canada have. Canada recently removed dairy from their guidelines after announcing they're going to look at unbiased research um, around that. And so they've, they've gone with like their, their whole foods and their, they've kept meat in there as well as like the tofu and stuff as their, their plant protein. Yeah, cool. I found that interesting. So on that, Dom, can you give us 45 seconds, your view on the current food pyramid and what you'd change if you would? Is it still the food pyramid? It's uh, been a while since no, I've seen No, no, it's our Australian Guide to Healthy Eating the Circle. The plate. The plate. Yep. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good word. That's exactly what it is. Um, if you get, So before you go, Tom, you're involved in uh, Dietetics Australia and Sports Dietetics Australia, is that correct? Sports, yes, Did, Vice President of SDA. There you go. Did you have any say in the food pyramid? Oh, or no, the, not so, at all. You no. Don't, 
I'm not you're that important. Not, you're, <laughs> not pull, you're not pulling those levers that I can, we can just no, get, get our own two cents in? No. Okay. <laughs> Listen, it, it is based on a huge body of research, okay? And if you actually get... And things in, like this move slowly. Very, very they, they slowly. Inc- they, they iterate and they progress slowly. So it's not like a couple of studies are going to come out and say wheat is bad and all the grains are going to be off the thing. Yeah. That's going to have to be weighed up against everything else that says wheat is good. Exactly. And I think you just have to, if you, if you look at it, what we what it looks like with the plate is that you've got your breads and your cereals or your grains group and your veggies group, which is taking that majority of that plate. Which is, which is your plant-based diet. Yes. And then you've got your dairy, your meat and your fruits, which are taking up the other the other bits. If you look at that, the, the issue that a lot of people have is that, well, it's so heavy on grains and mm. we already eat so many grains in our society – we have let, – let's take our, our – I guess we're different because we work with athletes. So, you know, let's let's look at the general population. Mm. In athletes, it's kind of like a lot of the problems is how do we get more nutrients Absolutely. into our people, not yes. less. Whereas the rest of the world is actually about how do we make them feel full, yes. how do we get them off their bums Absolutely. and – then reduce the calorie intake. Yes. Yeah. And what we've just said today is that um, carbohydrates, which are, is the main nutrient found in our grains group, fuels exercise, fuels daily living. Fuels your brain. Fuels your brain. Now, they, you know, if you're not doing a whole lot, you probably don't need a whole lot of that fuel. Yep. Um, so if you look at the, the, the representation on that plate, it does appear that it's very, very heavy in grains, which may not be helping our obese population. Okay, but if you actually look deep into it and look at, um, go to what they suggest serving size wise, uh, it's not a great deal of food. You know, it says six to eight um, serves of grains a day. Which is like, we've got to remember that a serve is not your bowl of pasta. That's exactly. two or three serves right there. Yeah, so if you have a bowl of pasta and maybe you have two cooked cups of pasta, which many of us, I mean, I come from an Italian family <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, you just eat that try. It if it's yeah. if it's cooked, you know. So by the time you sit down, <laughs> that's you have just a testing lot more. to see if it's al dente. <laughs> exactly right. Um, so I mean, and that's already four serves, mm. right? Just two cups. You so, haven't even put the sauce on. Yes, exactly. So so these are things we have to remember. You, you have to deep, get deep into what it's actually saying, mm. um, and if you actually follow that, it, it, it's not a bad diet. Yeah. yeah. But it starts with plants, so it starts with your veggies, and so you're vegan or not. Your biggest recommendation would be get more veg. Get more veg, absolutely. I'm not saying go get more grains. Um, I think that that really needs to to be based on what your current situation is and and what you're doing. But 100% we need to eat more veg. Yep, nice. Um, Josh, did you have any – so that's great takeaways for anyone who's thinking about this vegetarian, vegan thing or even who just wants to eat healthy and continue eating meat. That's all fantastic. Josh, would you have any advice for people who are thinking about being vegan or vegetarian? Uh, Do your own research. We're going to – put show notes up with links to things. Um, Do your own research. Don't base your diet just on one movie. Go on. If it sparks a thought, it sparks a conversation, go past that. Don't base it just on that. Don't do a 180. Nice. Nice. I just want to add to that, sorry. Um, The uh, understanding evidence is complicated. Mm. Um, You know, I've done a PhD and still probably don't understand it fully. So (laughs) it's it's complicated. what was your PhD in? I actually didn't do my PhD in sport. So um, I... It was in dietetics though. Oh, yes, yes. I looked at um, infant and maternal nutrition, uh, looked at iodine intake during pregnancy and the um, effects on on infants and and brain development. Wow, Mm. cool. Now I'm in sport with research as well. So, yeah. Yeah. but um, I think it's really important to understand that you, you cannot make a conclusion on one study. And when you read a blog um, or you listen to a podcast, uh, this is where the world is going, that they say this study found this. But that, that does not translate to we now go and do it. That, that contributes to the evidence base. Because if then, you want, you can find a study that says Especially in nutrition because it's so easy oh, yeah. and it's it's so easy to cherry pick and it's so hard to get good studies with good numbers of participants and good timelines and stuff like that and good control. You could find a study that says absolutely anything. 100%. And I'm not, Steak yeah. gives you cancer. Yeah. Steak saves the world. You know, this is this. Like anything you want, give me a thing and I'll probably find you a, a study, good or bad, that says something around those lines. Absolutely. Yeah, it is ridiculous. And, and you, you said it right, especially in nutrition, which is the frustrating thing about, about the industry, I guess. You know, the you can't control um, the studies as well as other as other disciplines when it comes to nutrition because there are so many confounding factors. 
And we just have to remember that um, mm-hmm. when we're reading things and when we're hearing things that you need to understand that there's always going to be another argument and a study that's going to say the opposite. So you need to make your own judgment and get the advice. And nutrition is still a very young science. Like we only discovered that calories gave us energy about 130, 140 years ago. When you think about physics and the fact that medicine, like human medicine, we've been doing dentistry for 10,000 years now, 7,000 years or something ridiculous. Nutrition 150 years. We've really been talking about calories in, macros, protein, carbohydrates, all these things. So it's really got a lot of – it's really in its infancy. It's still just a toddler in terms of best practice, best scientific methods, things like that. And the things that work for a physics study or a chemistry study don't always work when you're dealing with humans when there's so many variables – and the other thing, when we talk about you know microbiome and we talked about ethnic things and genetic factors affecting what works for you di- dietetically or from a nutritional point of view, is a lot of self-experimentation. Mm. So what what works well and what gives me boundless energy is not going to be the same thing that gives you boundless energy and helps put you to sleep. And same for Josh and same for all our athletes. So your stage of life, your, your culture, your background, what you've eaten in the last six months in terms of your microbiome, the last 10 years in terms of your culture and where you come from. And, you know, you're an Italian family, you eat lots of pasta. So it's going to be hard to say, oh, no, I'm going to do a, a carb-free diet as an Italian with an Italian family. Like, that's just tricky. And there's other, th- other things that need to be considered when you look at your diet, not just one documentary. Spot on. We're just going to leave it there. <laughs> I don't know. You're the host. <laughs> uh, any, any final thoughts? I'm, I'm pretty happy. I think we've covered everything. I think most people, no matter what level of sport you are, you need to be eating more plants, but that doesn't mean you have to be a vegan to get them. I think what we often see when people do transition to vegan and report all these amazing results is they're forced to eat plants they weren't eating before. They're forced to eat vegetables that before they were just crowding out with meat and chicken and fried things and stuff like that. So it's not so much the subtraction of meat that has improved their diet, but the increase in fiber and vitamins and minerals from their vegetables that's giving them the more balanced energy and things like that. And the taking out the meat correlates with the increase in that. So don't you might not necessarily have to eliminate meat, but maybe reducing some of your consumption, particularly poor, poor choices of meat, processed things, salamis, hamburgers, things like that, for better quality things. Maybe, like you mentioned, things like chicken, salmon, lighter meats, I suppose, for lack of a better word, and then increasing your veggie intake and less processed things in the middle. Oh, oh my goodness, we're at a balanced diet, and that's going to work for most people. Going on that, I think um, like processed meat is like a type 1 carcinogen from – world health organization so is alcohol and cigarettes and like most people aren't going to smoke and drink alcohol every single day at every single meal so it's like that like moderation you bring it down you're going to feel better hopefully no moderation on the cigarettes let's go with a strong no a strong no on the cigarettes and a and it's strong very occasionally or less on the alcohol but that's that's on processed meat so your salami your macas and things like that um so that's that's good to note um what i was going to say a final point was um those that say like it's a it's a very biased movie the game changes um and it's very blockbuster, which it's meant to be. Yep. If you're interested in just education and research and stuff like that, mm. watch Forks Over Knives. Very boring, very <laughs> bland, just research. But it's balanced. Gets the point across. Yeah. Um, I would say it's unbiased. It's done by two um, people with PhDs in nutrition, grew up on dairy farms, and their research finds certain things. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Don't, 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 yeah, don't ruin it before, yeah. they, before they watch the movie. Okay, yeah. we'll link to that one as well. Yeah. I think that's on Netflix too, isn't Netflix, it? Netflix, yeah. It dives into the China study, which is a big point of that as well. Yeah, cool. Dom, your, your final thoughts yeah, before just, we wrap up? Um, my final thoughts are that if you do a – if you're considering veganism, we said what, what to do from there, um, but just understand that if you do it poorly, that's when it can have – detriments to performance. I'm talking about an athlete now. If you do it poorly, it can actually have negative consequences. Mm. If you do it well, um, you're going to probably perform just as well. Yeah. So that's, I think, is the key there is, um, you know, my concern is that people that don't have resources to, you know, people like myself, um, don't have people, yep, access, don't have people to ask these questions and try things without the education can actually then, um, you know, have some, some negative consequences. So just, um, I think, do your research and, and get the help. The great news is Dom is available here at Core Advantage. Yes. Uh, consulting here once about once a month I think it is the plan for next year because you're pretty busy at the cats as well pretty busy at the cats pretty busy at Deacon my yep. actual job so <laughs> <laughs> Dom, just go to the cats for fun <laughs> Tom wears many hats uh, <laughs> some of them voluntary <laughs> some of them voluntary um, but, yes but I'm doing online consulting yes so, so uh, part of this podcast part of the nutrition event that was last week depending on when you're listening to this uh, that, that, that resource will be available very shortly as well so keep an eye on our social media if you want to see Dom's 
talk not just about veganism but uh, more of it. Your talk, which is in a couple of hours now, is going to be more about just general nutrition help for athletes. Absolutely. Just a, a, a background to nutrition to start the conversation. Yep. So we'll, we'll talk around uh, macros, we'll talk around supplementation. Um, I do um, some research in sleep as well with food and sleep, so touch on that as well just awesome. to get a, a broad overview of, of – and some supplementation stuff as well along yep. the, yeah beautiful um, so you'll be able to find that link if you check us out on Instagram or Facebook or on our website you'll be able to find a link to that talk we'll have that up on video people can just download that as they want and yet like Don mentioned she's available here at Quarter Advantage both in the flesh here at 39 Cleveland Road in Oakley South but also online so if you're somewhere around the world and you want to get access to what is an actual world class high performance sports dietitian and you want to get the same advice that elite athletes are getting in terms of fixing and on a more individual and a personalized point of view, uh, check out our website and you'll be able to book with Dom and she'll be able to give you all the help you need. Awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh and Dom, for joining me today on Thanks what was you. the most nervous I've ever been for a podcast because it's such a loaded topic. Yeah. You start talking about this and people start putting themselves in camps and it's not about camps. Just like everything and like everything this podcast always ends on, it's about balance. It's The answer is somewhere in between, which is not very exciting. No one's coming to watch this and pay thousands of dollars in tickets to come see the, the non-Game Changers podcast, but, it, <laughs> but unfortunately it's the truth. Awesome, everyone. Check out all the show notes, check out the links, and we'll see you guys around next time. Yeah. And before you go, hear from some of our alumni about our career-transforming course, The Online Mentorship. Learn more about how you can join at our website. I learnt the theory stuff at uni, but I didn't know how to apply it. And coming to Core Advantage was how I, I bridged that gap. So I, I knew the stuff, but I didn't know how to do the stuff. It was something that I needed to do personally for my own development. And it's allowed me to work in elite sport for now five years. So it was a massive help. I think mentorship is really important and being able to ask questions all the time and the Core Advantage course allows that because there is a big team of people that you can ask questions. I get to um, you know, train professional athletes every week, um, work really closely with professional athletes which is awesome. A lot of the skills that I'm applying uh, I learnt through the program at Core Advantage. It's not just something that you read and then think about and then go, oh, how, how does that tie into everything? It's, it's something that you, practical that you can turn around and go, this is exactly how I'm going to apply it. Um, and the concepts that you learn help you as a, as a coach, as a professional, as a person. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Definitely go and do it. To sign up for the online mentorship, head to coreadvantage.training slash mentorship.